Howdy, everybody. You'd think we had tamales out there or something. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It's really great to see everybody present. Uh, happy December 1st, right? This year has gone by quickly. Um, and it's good to see everybody. The time is now 8.30. I will call the, uh, the meeting to order uh, Board of Directors for the Corpus Christi Regional Transportation Authority. First order business is Pledge of the Allegiance. Uh, Armando, would you please lead us in the pledge? To a roll call, Steph, would you please help us out? Eddie Martinez. Present. Jan Landecker. Here. Patricia Dominguez. Here. Lynn Allison. Here. Jan Landecker. Here again. <laughs> Elor Salazar. Here. Philip Kowarczyk. Here. Anna Jimenez. Here. Gabby Canales. Present. Matt Woolbright. Present. Beatrice Chato. Present. Armando Gonzalez. Here. Mr. Chairman, there is a quorum. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I may take a, a moment to uh, interject, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the new executive assistant to the RTA family. Marisa Montiel joined us uh, this week and will be working through my office and with y'all as uh, the, the board uh, secretary. So, uh, again, very pleased to to have her join our team. Welcome. Happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, Marisa. Welcome. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, item three is a safety briefing. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Board of Directors. If there's an emergency, uh, Board of Directors will exit through the uh, kitchen door. Everybody else will exit uh, to my immediate right. Uh, you will report to the clock tower adjacent to the uh, uh, transfer station. Stephanie will make sure that everybody's accounted for in the board of directors. I'll make sure everybody exits this building properly. During the emergency, please do not return back uh, to the building unless it's all clear. Uh, do not utilize the elevator. And if we have to shelter in place, we'll shelter on the west side stairwell. Thank you, and good morning again, and Merry Christmas, an early one. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <coughs> Item four is receipt uh, of conflict of interest affidavits. Have any been submitted? None. Thank you. Uh, item five is opportunity for public comment. Has anybody signed up for public comment? None. Uh, I see some visitors coming in. Would anybody like to uh, speak? Uh, three minute uh, limitation. Open it up. And moving forward, item six, discussion of possible action to approve the Board of Director meeting minutes of November 3rd. Is there a motion? So moved, Chairman. We have a motion by Secretary Leindecker. Is there a second? Second. Second. Was that uh, Mr. Wilbright? I'm sorry, who was that? Canales. Oh, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Director Canales. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item seven is award recognitions by the CEO, Government uh, Finance Officers Association. The Government Finance Officers Association was pleased to announce that the Corpus Christi Regional Transportation Authority has received the GFOA's Distinguished Budget Presentation Award for its budget. The award represents a significant achievement by the 
Corpus Christi RTA. It reflects the commitment the Board of Directors and staff have to meet the highest principles of governmental budgeting. In order to receive the budget, the entity had to satisfy nationally recognized guidelines for effective budget presentation. These guidelines are designed to assess how well an entity's budget serves as a policy document, a financial plan, an operations guide, and a communications device. Budget documents must be rated proficient in all categories and in the 14 mandatory criteria within those categories to receive the award. So I'm very pleased here today to announce that uh, we have an award and we'd like to present it to Alejandro Agustin, our budget officer here with the RTA. Mr. Chair, you can join me down. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jorge. And job well done. Thank you, sir. Item uh, eight is update on the RCAT committee activities. Good morning, everyone, and thank you. Uh, Sharon Montes, Managing Director of Capital Programs and Customer Services. All right, so at the meeting that we had um, November 18th, our three new RCAP members joined us at that point in time. And so I basically went over the mission statement, the bylaws, some of the bylaws, what our beeline service is all about, and I will somewhat go through these briefly. So here's our RCAP mission statement, to provide knowledge, guidance, and insight to the RTA and the community on transportation disadvantaged riders and services. Committee members act as ambassadors on transportation ridership issues. RCAP purpose, and I'm, I won't read through all of these, but basically they monitor the performance of beeline paratransit and fixed route services through monthly statistical reports, which I present. Um, some of the uh, information comes from our monthly operational reports, which Derek presents to the board. Our CAP membership includes 10 members. These 10 members represent citizens with disabilities, beeline and fixed route service riders, public agencies, and the general community. RCAT terms. Each member is appointed to a two-year term, except for the chairperson who serves at the pleasure of the RTA board. The terms are staggered, and members may be appointed for up to four consecutive two-year terms. Meetings and quorums. They meet the third Thursday of each month at noon, and we alternate between route evaluation meetings and regular meetings. Now, during COVID, we've been doing uh, virtual meetings, but once we resume the regular meetings, we'll do that again. We have no meetings in July and December. Beeline services. What is Beeline? Beeline is a shared ride public transportation service for people whose disabilities prevent them from using accessible fixed route service. What is the eligibility process? You can request an application. They're also online. You complete both parts of the application, once for the individual and once for a medical professional. Return the apl application. You will complete an in-person interview and assessment, and within 20 days, 
21 days you receive your status. During those 21 days, you are allowed to use the service temporarily. In order to determine uh, eligibility, there are four tests. Test one, does the individual's disability prevent them from getting to and from a station or stop at the point of origin or destination? Can the individual board and utilize and disembark the vehicle at the station or stop? Can the individual recognize the destination and disembark? If a system involves a transfer and connections, are the paths of travel between lines or modes of accessible or unnavigable by the individual? Then there are various types of eligibility, unconditional, conditional, and, and temporary eligibility. There, we went through what the fares are, how you have to schedule, what the window is, and so this kind of gave the new board members a summary of the overall process. I included the information for a contact person. Uh, this will be our calendar for next year. I also provided an update on the fixed route holidays and service levels, and I also may inform them about the engineering services for ADA bus stop phase eight. I went through some of the key metrics, which the board has already seen through Derek's presentation, but I like to keep them informed so that they know how ridership is and so forth. Our next meeting will be January 20th, 2022. That concludes my presentation, sir. Any questions for Sharon, Marquette? Sure. On, um, I know we've discussed at some point in the future potentially talking about changing fares. Would these fares also be implicated by this? Yes, ma'am, they would. Yes. Yes. Just a quick question, Sharon. Uh, the the in-person interview is that done at their residence or here? That is done here, sir. During COVID, we were doing them over the phone, so there's a way to do it over the phone, but. Again, we're going back to in-person, um, and so they do have to come in here. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, Sharon. You, sir. Item nine is committee chair reports. Um, are there any comments from the administration finance chair? Uh, I, I have none at this time. Uh, operations capital projects chair. Item 10 is uh, an update on the zero emissions. Mr. Chairman, Board, I'd like to make a few introductory comments. KPMG is a national firm that, uh, that was originally a, a CPA firm in the financial markets, but over the last few decades has ventured into other areas of business, in, business enterprise. One of those areas is in the electrification of transit. Uh, at, at one of our meetings, Derek and I met with KPMG and, and asked if they could do a no-cost uh, analysis of the RTA, the industry, and uh, what the outlook is for uh, electrification, zero emissions in our industry. They graciously agreed to do it at no cost, and, and they are here to present the report, and I won't take any more thunder away from Derek. Any other comments, sir? Perfect introduction. I just want to welcome Guy Wilkinson from KPMG, who will conduct the presentation. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, so I'm Guy Wilkinson. I'm a partner within uh, KPMG's Infrastructure Advisory Practice. Um, so let me just move on to the... Perfect. Uh, so maybe just to give you a brief overview um, of our team first, and just give you a little bit of background there. Uh, so we focus on advising clients in and around infrastructure and projects. Um, we've Derek, been operating in the- Derek, can you get the mic a little closer to you? Yeah, I can speak closer as well if that's better. Yeah. Perfect, excellent, oh, thank you. Super, thanks very much. So we've been working with, with clients, mainly state and local government clients, um, working with Texas Department of Transportation now for the last 15 years on delivering innovative projects for them. Uh, I also lead uh, KPMG's public transportation business as well, which means that we're working with many transit agencies 
across the country, including MBTA up in Boston, New Jersey Transit, LA Metro, um, just to give you a DART in Dallas as well. So that gives you kind of a brief overview of, of that. Um, we split the practice up into sort of three distinct areas, sort of infrastructure strategy practice, which is focused on sort of matters around capital program prioritization, asset management strategy. We also have a capital projects business as well, which focuses with clients in and around how to execute successfully around major transformational infrastructure programs. And then we also have an ESG practice now as well, which is focused on some of the environmental impact associated with the built environment and with infrastructure in general. So we were asked to uh, sort of t take a give, wanted to give you really a sort of a general overview today of, of the state of, of play in and around zero emission buses. So um, as you all know, um, the majority of buses today are diesel powered, human driven buses. And that really um, illustrates the sort of picture across sort of major US cities and regions. Um, you know, there are a variety of factors that are coming into play around health, environmental impact, and cost as well, which have meant um, agencies have, across the country really have been exploring and implementing zero emission bus technology and looking at opportunities to reduce uh, emissions generally. Um, and we're beginning to see a sort of a real pattern emerging in and around that. Um, as of the end of last year, there were approximately 2,800 buses in operation that were effectively classified as zero emission. That was broken down into um, majority being battery electric buses, but we're also seeing a, so a small proportion as well that are using hydrogen fuel cell technology as well. Um, and then the pipeline is, is, is looking pretty strong as well. There are um, um, a, a sort of a number of active orders out there as well, just under 2,000 bus orders in place. Uh, so really the majority of uh, US agencies now are looking and exploring this technology. Here we just give you a bit of an overview of um, what we're seeing elsewhere in the country, um, pretty broad range. Here in the state of, of Texas, you've got Houston uh, Metro, who've adopted a goal of 100% zero emission buses by 2030, which is a pretty aggressive target, considering many other agencies are, have got similar targets out there at the moment, um, and there is you know, huge pressure on manufacturers to produce. And also the technology is evolving and emerging all the time. Um, Houston has already, though, and beginning to, and this is kind of illustrative, I think, of what we see elsewhere in the country, are beginning to develop pilot programs and start to purchase small batches of buses um, to to address those 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 goals, and then beginning to sort of ramp up over time. We're also seeing it with Dart as they as they move forward to. Um, um, transitioning to uh, zero emission by 2045. Um, they're in the process at the moment of evaluation. And again, that's I think probably an, a, another characteristic that we're seeing right across the country at the moment, right? Most agencies are beginning to make small purchases, but also are thinking about how to develop clear strategic plans that they can execute on successfully. Um, we've also <laughs> been recently hired by LA Metro to advise them on their transition of fleet. They've got a fleet of 2,200 vehicles at the moment, and they're aiming to transition those. Again, pretty aggressive target by 2030 to 100% zero emission. So just in terms of some of the analysis that we've, 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 we've done for, for, for other clients has really been around helping clients think about the, um, the goals 
um, understand exactly what the um, priorities are that they have as organizations. Um, ensuring that there is an alignment between those decarbonization and zero emission goals and broader asset management strategies across the organization. What we found generally is that there are pilot programs in place at agencies, um, but they aren't necessarily coordinated into one singular strategy. So we've been helping clients thread the needle there. Um, and then we've really done sort of a current ass 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 state assessment of the state of play within those agencies and help them identify gaps in terms of where to improve. And there are key enablers in terms of how to deliver on that strategy around capital planning and financing. And then we've gone through the process of working with clients to actually develop and implement a roadmap to deliver and execute successfully. We also just wanted to give you um, a brief overview and just kind of maybe illustrate this as well. Um, this sits outside of the, the, the transit sector but we've, we've also found that, um, you know, agencies have, um, you know, for a variety of reasons, come to decisions around looking at electrification, around zero emission technology to deliver their businesses. Um, we've been recently working with the Port of Virginia on um, an entire program at looking at their decarbonization <coughs> strategy. They were um, feeling impacted by actually their supply chain and the, the customer base that they were operating with. They were working with many wholesalers around the country, Target, Walmart, Amazon, who were putting pressure on the port to actually think more clearly and have a cohesive strategy around decarbonization and zero emission reduction over time. And um, this became really a sort of rallying call for the port to take a look at this more seriously and have and create a clear pathway towards achieving net zero carbon neutrality by, by 2040. Uh, so we work with them very closely around that, helping them define and baseline their existing performance, establishing that actual baseline based on um, when they actually started the zero emission journey. So in actual fact, while they were only looking at this and trying to solve this problem in 2021, we went back and actually figured out that it was more appropriate to start measuring um, performance around zero emission from 2016 when really um, a number of key initiatives were taking place um, around electrification of crane technology and things like that that drove, drove that, 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 that towards that net zero goal. So you can see on the right hand side of this, this particular chart here, the sort of key milestones that have begun to um, tackle this problem around greenhouse gas reduction and the, and, and the sort of major milestones that are in play to actually achieve that goal. We've also then developed a, um, what we call a pathways tool model as well which enables um, our clients to take a look at the impact of those investments around electrification and uh, carbon neutral technology on, on their business. And actually not only look at it from the perspective of greenhouse gas reduction, but also measure it in terms of return on investment as well. So we've been able to actually calculate over time significant and material savings associated with shifting towards um, greater decarbonization amongst uh, both fuel and equipment on the site um, at the port and identified about $23 million worth of net present value savings associated with that. So really, I mean, that's one of the key messages here is that you've got, you've got, you've got many, many factors that are impacting agencies around making decisions around looking at zero emission technology. Um, it comes from external pressures like the port in terms of their customer base. It comes from pressures from potentially from legislation at local level, at state level. It comes from pressure in terms of environmental groups putting more pressure on public agencies to perform and address climate uh, change issues. 
but also, you know, fundamentally, you've got to demonstrate that this makes good business sense and good economic sense as well. And through the process here, we've been able to sort of establish and achieve that goal as well. So with that, I'll sort of wrap up. I don't know whether anybody's got any questions or happy to take them now or at the, after the session completes. I've got one. Uh, on this slide, are you factoring in the capital outlay at the beginning? Yes, we are. Yeah. So, so you know, when, we, when we're looking at sort of uh, return on investment, we're looking at that initial capital cost, the operational cost savings associated with the investment as well over time. Um, I would say as well, and we didn't really touch on it, you know, the, the, um, the um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act as well um, is also providing some additional incentives here for agencies as well to consider, which may provide some additional seed capital to reduce that initial capital outlay. So, for example, there's about $24.5 billion allocated under the Act at the moment, um, of which there's about $13 billion that's tied to um, zero emission technology around medium and heavy uh, duty vehicles as well. So there's a there are opportunities not only to sort of take fat, I mean, and factor in obviously the capital costs, but also offset those costs with some of the grant programs that are getting introduced now. And how much of this projection is based on grant programs continuing indefinitely? <laughs> so this one is actually, actually not based on any. So th th this particular projection here and this analysis here doesn't take into account those grant programs because actually when we were doing the work, that wasn't um, actually contemplated within the, the analysis. So you're, you're yes. saying here in this chart, you're, you're saying make all the investment at once, either here between 2021 and 2023, to achieve so, this $23 million in savings? So a, a, lot, a, lot of that, a lot of that capital outlay does apply over a sort of a five-year time horizon. So you can see that, that those numbers sort of dropping, yes, yeah, significantly over time. But there is, there, is, there is a shift in terms of making that um, investment over time. Obviously, this analysis would vary depending on how you phase the investment as well. So to the extent to which um, you look at it over a longer time frame, then yeah, that would have an impact in terms of the, the return on investment, the time associated. If we do the investment that. over a longer time frame, do we capture then the technology gains? As you know, their technology gains are, are increasing every year. Um, well, I think that's, that's the challenge in this sector right at the moment. Um, because technology is rapidly changing and expanding all the time, so the decision about when to move is important. And I think that's why we're seeing in the transit sector, most agencies aren't going out there and saying, okay, we'll, 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 we'll do this all in a five-year time horizon and replace all our technology, because ultimately that might be superseded 10 years down the line. So most, most agencies at the moment are, are, are committing to sort of pilot programs, testing the technology out, building out some of the infrastructure as well, because it's not just about replacing one vehicle with another. It impacts everything in terms of uh, charging technology, um, where that's placed. It impacts um, maintenance facilities as well. Uh, so we're working currently with New Jersey Transit on a new uh, bus maintenance facility. And part of the challenge there is they're in this transitional period, right? They're looking to build a facility they're predominantly diesel at the moment. They have, they're having to shift over time to, to electric vehicles, and they're having to figure out, well, what do, I, what do I do in terms of investment into this large new maintenance and storage facility? Um, I think part of the key to this is working with the bus manufacturers and tying those investments in, in infrastructure and bus storage and fueling technology to the, the rollout and the delivery of the, the the, the buses themselves. So we're having, we're working with New Jersey there around getting into dialogue with not only um, investors and contractors, but also the bus manufacturers to see whether there are opportunities to leverage um, programs around purchase of vehicles alongside the construction new maintenance facilities as well, and create some degree of economies of scale there. I think you hit the nail on the head. It'd be a top to bottom change in infrastructure and personnel, well, training of personnel on to be able to repair 
exactly. and work on these electric or hydrogen e exactly. E exactly. And um, I think our belief is that has to start with a strategy. I think what we're seeing some agencies make the mistake of is, is kind of create discrete sort of siloed focused programs looking, you know, discreetly at trying to solve individual problems around, for example, um, range, right? So MBTA at the moment are looking at hybrid technology. They have it, they're covering a vast range. So they have to think about electric and also hydrogen technology at the same time. But they're not then factoring at the moment sort of the impact that has on the, uh, the whole sort of infrastructure. So, it, I mean, I think that's evolving, right? And I think they're recognizing that now. But the, I think we would advocate for a, a holistic approach to understanding it and the impact, to your point, um, than the, both the phasing and the timing, but also how you can actually um, bring leverage, leverage private capital and innovation as well with, with manufacturers and potentially with investment capital. Um, a lot of the work we've done in the last 15 years in the US has been exactly that. It's been working with Texas Department of Transportation, for example, on how to bring private capital to the table as well. Um, the, numbers, the numbers that are in the infrastructure bill sound big, but then when you kind of spread them across 300 agencies across the country, you know, you're still going to have to find other alternative means to deliver alternate forms of financing and funding as well to assist you in delivery as well. Thank you very much. Do you have some comments? Basically, basically <clears throat> as I understand where the marketplace is today, yeah. is there's, there's, there's a lot of encouragement to go uh, zero emissions, to go electric. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, the FTA includes language about electrification mm -hmm. as part of the new grant programs, but not solely just for electrification. Yeah. There's monies for continued alternative fuels. Yeah. And, and as I understand it, there isn't, there may be some state requirements, for example, like in California, that they've made a commitment that the entire transit industry will be electric in yep. 2040, I think. Yep. And, and there's some that some communities have done and transit agencies have done on their own. Yep. But at, at, at this point, there isn't a mandatory date no. that requires transit agencies to move at any point in time. There's, there is time for us to, to evaluate our, our system, our electrical system, to be sure that it can support that type of uh, effort at Bear Lane. That's right. And, and other facilities uh, associated. So it, 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 in my opinion, it is a good time to join in the e formal evaluation, but without a commitment for a specific start date. Yeah. We need to, we need to analyze what we have here locally, and that may take a little bit of money to actually hire consultants right. to help us, firms like, like yours or others. Right. And then we can move forward with some formal transitional plan that then the board can adopt a, a target date. We can adopt how we want to transition, how we phase out the existing fleet with their maturities for, for useful life and all of those processes. So yep. it, it, it's, it'll be a multi-step effort, but it's a good time to start considering maybe making that commitment to start seriously looking at zero emissions. Yeah. Recognizing we're in an oil and gas state <laughs> and CNG is perfect yeah. for that, that yeah. type of operation. Yeah. Where does CNG fit? Is that a low emission? Yeah. Is it a low emission? Yeah, I think it qualifies as that, yeah. Um, I, I didn't catch that last part. What would you say? Yes, it does qualify as low emission, yeah. Oh. I have a question. So this looks like if we engage and start taking the next step, it's a, it's a large capital investment up front. And how adaptive is that equipment to new technology coming all the time? The, uh, the, the funding is coming around now, mm -hmm. and, and they, it has a three-year spending cycle that you can use that money at. <clears throat> so you could, you could apply for the grants, right. even though we're not ready, and, and then use
use them for system upgrades as part of the investment. But it's a system upgrade. It's not a replacement of a new fleet that we just purchased. Because this is going to be rapidly advancing with the technology. Right. Is this initial potential initial purchase going to be adaptive to the upgrade? Well, that, that, that's what we need to evaluate as part of our transition plans. Yeah. Look at all of the things that play into making a move. Can, can we buy a handful of buses today? Yeah, we could. The board could. And, and, and they would play a role with our system. But if you're going to look at it seriously, then we should look at how a transition plan would work. That's right to do a zero-based emissions yeah. fleet. Would this study what would be eligible under the grant uh, infrastructure bill? That's a good question. The, the, the rules haven't been finalized yet. Yeah. Potentially, but yeah, it's not clear. Any grants available to work on transition for, I mean, I know that there's several, I mean, obviously the buses, the lights at our, at our bus stops and things like that. Um, and obviously we don't know either because of the different options, whether it be electric, whether it be hydrogen, we would have to get somebody to actually do a feasibility study uh, based on all of that. Is there any grants to help us do that? Uh, not at the present time for that kind of work, but the, the market is changing quickly with the, uh, the guidelines on the new grants. <clears throat> and that's something we could ask our people in Washington to help us with. So uh, it, it's a, it's a new new part of our industry, mm -hmm. and and I, I think we should be opening those doors to explore. Director Wilbrack, this uh, net present cost is a sure. pretty dramatic scale increase over mm -hmm. this organization. What is the amount of capital you're talking about in this example? So, and just to be clear here, this is not your right. agency, yeah, right? This is yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the original capital outlay of this, actually, I, I don't know in terms of what the initial cost is for this in terms of where, the, where, where they're at. I mean, if you look at the net present cost ranges there, I think that gives you probably an order of magnitude. It's about half a billion dollars worth of investment that VPA, Virginia Ports, were making um, during that period of time. And then they were looking at different forms of technology to, to drive to that goal, that, that difference between the sort of 503 effectively is a sort of a, a kind of a, a do nothing, don't, don't shift in terms of technology change to continue doing what you're doing today versus um, the 480, which is sort of moving towards that sort of decarbonization electrification goal. So if I understand correctly, you're saying the investment is that top number? No, so the, 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 those, those are outputs. So those, the, the numbers, the top, the two, well, really all those numbers are ranges in terms of value, in terms of net present cost associated with um, the project. Now, w one is a comparison of basically doing, doing nothing, keeping existing technology, maintaining and operating that, making, obviously it needs to be replaced, life cycle requires it to be replaced, so there's, there's capital costs embedded into that 503. The 480 represents um, an investment profile that includes a, a greater shift towards decarbonization goals. So the, num so the numbers within there, and I don't have the exact breakout of the capital versus operating cost. So within all those numbers there, there's a capital component, there's an operating component. I would have to get you that information, Matt. Happy to do that though, just to show you kind of the, the order of magnitude between the yeah. two. I just want to make sure my context is right. So what we're looking at is saving a little bit under half a percent a year uh, is the net savings in this scenario, yeah, in, in not counting the capital outlay. It's, um, let me think this through. Well, it's, it's roughly, it's more than half a percent, isn't it, I think? It's 4.5% yeah, yeah, over 10 years, yeah, so yeah, 0.45. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Mr. Gover, comment? Yeah, just a couple of questions. One, are we able to consider, if we get these grants, to retrofit some of these buses to zero emissions, or they can we retrofit them with what we have? Question. Jorge. Probably. Go on. 
There is a process for um, basically rebuilding buses and Complete Coachworks is an example of a company that takes old buses and rebuilds them. But um, that, that we'd have to do an analysis of the cost factor because they're not cheap to, to do that and then you're, you still have to have a useful life. Once you pay for that rebuild process, the FTA is still going to say that you have to keep that bus forever. So while the batteries and everything may be due, that the frame may be 20 years old and things like that. So we'd have to do an analysis of that. But, but also, you know, we're going to be applying for grants, I'm assuming out of this infrastructure bill, and some of that money could be utilized to do that question. We don't know the language for everything that's in there yet, and they're telling us it's going to be March, April, whenever when the rules come out for it. There's a possibility. It seems like it would be a logical direction. But again, before we uh, sure. <clears throat> take any steps, I would want us to evaluate the entire system. Absolutely. Well, hopefully we'll take these comments the that we're making today be. into consideration when you do your analysis. Um, I know that when we had gone over some of the, you had at one point explained to me that I guess because of COVID, we're kind of top heavy on our fleet. Uh, would that affect us getting new buses under the FTA because we are of where we're at? Or are we still going to be able to qualify even though we have more buses and we do riders? That, that's an excellent question. One we actually have asked our consultants in D.C., and I, I believe they're, they're, they've had the meeting or they're getting ready to have the meeting with the FTA, so we're going to get a response on that shortly, hopefully. The, the indication is that they will begin to soften their approach on uh, spare ratios. So the answer is going to be hopefully yes. yes. <clears throat> well, we're not the only agency experiencing a downturn, right? It's nationwide. Yeah. Um, I think they're, they're aware of that. And, and, and they want when they open up the application, the grants for application, they want people to apply for projects. So they're 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 in the, the position of having to. I don't want to say soften, but uh, lessen their emphasis on certain criteria, so that they can get people to apply. Well, listen, I appreciate the presentation. This is exactly what we need to continue to do, strategize and look at where we are and where we want to be and imp implement the steps to get there while we all continue to get educated on what zero emissions and a different, uh, uh, whether it's true electrification, uh, hydrogen, a combination, et cetera. Uh, so appreciate you and Derek bringing uh, Mr. Wilkinson and Andrea. Thank you Amanda very much here. to KPMG for the look at us uh, complimentary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next item of business is our consent items. Uh, item 11, the following items are routine or administrative in nature and have been discussed previously by the Board of Committees. The Board has been first with these support documentations on these items. Uh, today I see items A through G. Uh, if anyone wishes to uh, remove any of these items for further discussions, please let me know, and we will vote on the rest. I item C. Item C, okay. Awesome, item E. Item E, got it. Okay. Is there a motion for items A, B, D, F, and G? So moved. We have a motion by Director Salazar. Is there a second? Second. Second. By Director Jimenez. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Any opposed? Same sign? The motion passes. Start off with item C action to exercise option pair for depository and banking services. Good morning. Good morning. Do you want me to just go over the presentation, or do you have I some just, questions? I just, I just had a question because, I mean, we covered it at the meeting. Yes, sir. And um, I had made a comment um, that wanted to see a response, and I, I did not see it in the responses. I guess it, it was either maybe you were going to do it here or We maybe. put it in the weekly update that week, that same week. I didn't see it. Okay. Maybe if you could pull it up. Um, and, and basically, it's the, the, the question was, could we do business with the credit union? Right. And the response is that no, we, because of 
certain requirements of the law, like collateralization and, and such, yeah, and ownership and whatnot, that that credit unions aren't an avenue for us to. Uh, I didn't see it in the report. If we could have gotten it at least this way, I could have analyzed it and have had additional questions. Mr. Bell, is is that uh, yeah, the is it, the problem is. Uh, it, in order to make uh, an investment in a credit union, you have to be a member of the credit union. They're owned by their members. Okay. And uh, under the state law, the RTA is prohibited from being a member of any okay. private organization or a stockholder of any private organization. Uh, that, that's the one problem. And then the, the other issue is just on collateralization. You have to have a uh, – they have to be holding federal securities equal to our balances uh, in order to – Collateralize our balances. So and the that. reason I bring it up is I'm on another. I'm on a foundation for Del Mar College, and um, we actually put money in. For a nonprofit, that is it's okay. excellent. Yeah. That, that's okay. not a problem. It's okay. just uh, for the governmental entity is the only prohibition that we have. If we could just put that in the minutes, I just you know because I raised the question and I didn't see it in the comments. So. All right, I, I thought it was sent November, November 19th. They, they sent an email on November 19th to all the board members and they addressed the credit unions. So I didn't see probably that. in your email there. Okay, Thank that you. being said, Mr. Dr. Salzer, are you okay? Okay, um, then we'll take a vote real quick on that one, just so that we can take these individually. Uh, is there a motion for the action to exercise option period for depository and banking services? So moved, Mr. Chair. Who was that, I'm sorry? No. Okay, Director Allison, motion, is there a second? Second. Director, Director McManus. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes, thank you. Item E is action to adopt a resolution to approve a change to the investment policy designation and the agency's investment advisor and approve the list of brokers dealers. Uh, just a quick highlight on the changes to the investment policy. Yes, sir. That's so what I was looking for. There was a couple of changes on there. We had, um, if I can remember off the top of my head, we had a change where we went from 12 months T bill to a six month as our as our baseline to give a better indication of what the market's doing. And then we added some dealers and brokers on there. Uh, one had minute did a main name change. So those are very minor changes. Okay. That's all I want to check. Okay. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt the uh, resolution for, uh, resolution to approve a change to the investment policy designation agency investment uh, advisor and approve the list of brokers and dealers? So moved. So moved. We have a Director Wilbright. Is there a second? A second. Second. Director Dominguez. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. All righty. Item 12, CCRTA's response to COVID-19. <coughs> Stephanie, you gonna be there? All right. Our efforts continue to be uh, on the safety side on the COVID uh, fr front, uh, mitigating the, uh, the, the COVID in our communities are uh, objective with the RTA facilities and equipment. We are partnering with the health district to uh, have uh, Bear Lane as one of their clinics uh, periodically during the month so that not only our employees but the community can come to Bear Lane and receive their vaccinations and uh, the, the flu shots as well as the COVID scenario. Uh, we are continuing to participate with the health district with our uh, free rides program to any of the facilities that our buses uh, uh, pass by on their routes. And we have continued to, we are continuing to wear masks as we are required by the FTA. And uh, we've uh, issued more than uh, half a million masks uh, through the buses in our system. Next slide. We have uh, 69 total injections administered to our employees and, and, and the, the vast majority were boosters over the last few months. Uh, we have uh, the 55 employees and the dependents that receive those shots and three and the contract employees and 11 community members that uh, also participate. And then the staff was vaccinated as of November 22. We have 173 employees and 69 uh, transportation employees from MV and we continue to inform our employees and make everybody aware that uh, it's important to, to get those shots and get those boosters uh, we have uh, 
uh, done away for the time being all uh, remote work and uh, we are fully staffed at all of our facilities uh, every day now beginning last Monday and as I always say safety is our emphasis And employees can have their families vaccinated as part of the program so that uh, we are looking at it holistically from the whole family perspective. If one family member gets the flu, everybody gets the flu. If, if uh, one family member gets COVID, the whole family is at risk for COVID. So we we're taking the approach with the health department to provide uh, our facilities so that anyone can get vaccinated and trying to make it as easy as, as possible. I'm very pleased to announce that my son, Jonas, uh, took his two shots like a champ and right. uh, walked out. So, <laughs> but uh, our, again, our focus is prevention and safety. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Item 13 is the presentation, Sam. Uh, investment report as of September 30th, 2021 from Linda Patterson. Good morning, Robert Solani, Managing Director of Administration. On the line, we have Linda Patterson from Patterson and Associates, and uh, she will uh, go over the presentation. Thank you very much, Robert, and um, good morning to uh, Mr. Chairman and the board. Um, I'm going to look at your portfolio um, by quarter here, starting out. Um, as you can see, the normal variation in the um, uh, total book and market value of the portfolio is natural. It's a natural flow as funds come into and out of, of the authority. Um, and we are ending up September with $49 million uh, after some expenditures during the year uh, for some buses, especially that were brought, Aerobox that's, that were bought for $5.3 million. Um, so that's uh, part of that flow down. The average yield, as you look over the quarter, uh, very much uh, reflects what's happening in the markets all over. Uh, we've started at a rousing 0.09% uh, in March, and then um, it has been sliding down um, as the market has been fighting, dealing with COVID, with now Omicron, um, and with the uncertainty about what the Fed is going to do. Uh, it's still very close to the benchmark. Uh, you'll see that mark moved up slightly in September, and that's just uh, the market reacting to, again, what the Fed is going to do. Unfortunately, the earnings reflect the yields that are in the market, and we have gone from $10,000 to eight to seven. I fully expect that during the next year in 2022 that we'll see an improvement there because of what's happening. But as we go to the next slide, you can see that at, at the end of September, um, this was your portfolio. It's uh, $49 million and it's sitting in cash um, in order to meet some of the outflows and, and the liabilities that you need uh, on an operating basis. In addition, we have been working with staff and with the bank to get your safekeeping account open, which will allow us to put securities into the into the portfolio. But right now, the weighted average maturity, because it is liquid, is one day. So you have total liquidity in the portfolio, and the weighted average yield uh, for the for the period um, ending at a point oh six and uh, average. Their estimated average earnings for that kind of return is $29,000. And the asset allocation um, by sector, you can see that the money is sitting in tech school and it is also sitting in a liquid position. The next slide, however, tells what we've been working with staff to, to go towards. This is the goal. And um, we're retaining your benchmark change, but your maximum weighted average maturity for the portfolio at one year um, allows uh, allows us to structure a portfolio that's slightly different, well, very different, still keeping 20% of the portfolio very liquid for anything that would happen and for your normal operating operations. The zero to one year area We'd like to put more, mo more money out there to work in, and 
put about 20% of it out there, stretching out slightly into the two-year and three-year area, including a better diversification, as you can see on the circle graph. What we expect that to do with today's rates would be to raise it from, uh, to a weighted average maturity of, of just under one year, and you can see what it does to the earnings. It takes it up to from 29,000 up to 100, 197,000. So that's our goal as we go forward here. One of the reasons that we feel that that is, on the next slide, that that is very doable is going back to 2015 and looking at the total balance of the portfolio for CCRTA. Obviously, moving down as you have increased your fleet and the operating expenses, but you can see that um, during that entire period, there's definitely 10 to $15 million that has been stable. Um, there's money running through there, but it's a stable balance or core that we can use to spread the portfolio out a little bit longer into that one and two year area, which of course is where we get um, some better earnings for, uh, for the portfolio. On the next slide, uh, just a, 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 that the spikes in the revenues from 2020 through September 21 are due in large part to the federal finance assistance. And um, you all have been discussing uh, the, the new um, Build Back America plans and the transit plans that are coming out, and that is expected to increase those balances over the next year also. On the next slide, uh, the reason that I have at least a little bit of optimism here on the rates uh, is that uh, this is what the Federal Reserve is looking at. And just, this, uh, just yesterday, Chairman Powell of the Federal Reserve announced that he is going to start moving and we, the market now definitely anticipates that they will start tapering and pulling some money out of the uh, amount that they have been buying over the last year and a half at $120 billion a, a month. And they'll start reducing that at least by $15 billion every month. A lot of that is geared towards um, maintaining the kind of growth that we have in the, in the um, economy. And that's what you see in that first group of, of uh, of bars there, um, where you see a, a big change coming up and anticipated in 22 and then 23, so that the GDP is still going to be very strong. The second group is employment, and you said the Fed is trying to keep that employment rate, um, the employment rate, not the unemployment rate, but the employment rate high and keep it, um, so we don't have less than 2% on unemployment. The inflation, of course, is the news of the day. We have massive inflation in the economy, and that part of the tapering um, of all of the um, efforts of the Fed are what hopefully will bring us back to that 2% on inflation. So there is major change coming about. Um, on the next slide, I was giving an uh, a graph, an idea of what inflation has done here. And you can see uh, that massive is not an overstatement. Um, it is definitely what's happening in the economy. And it looks uh, very much like uh, that inflation is starting to affect consumers. Also, the retail sales um, show that it's much, much higher. The people are spending a lot of money but unfortunately, they're spending a lot of money for less. So Santa is definitely going on a budget here. And um, even though personal income was down and now is picking back up again, um, it's still a situation where that inflation is getting in the way of everything um, in the economy. But when the Fed starts to tighten back down again, and that's um, often scary to people, it's not going to hurt us. Um, it is definitely going to start toning down on some of this inflation, hopefully, and they're going to focus on the results uh, and the long-term uh, 
reduction of inflation that's very difficult right now because of the supply chains we can't get the products in you're already hearing about that before Christmas go out and buy the toys early kind of thing the supply chains and the employment figures because a lot of people if mandates come in because of Omicron we have lots of statistics that will say that people would rather stay out than go into work in fact a recent study said that the truckers who have to move the supplies through the economy would have the unions have said that they would have 37 percent of their people leave the jobs rather than have to go under the mandate for for vaccinations and the accommodation as I say which the Fed is starting to tighten this doesn't mean that they're going to start raising rates immediately that probably won't happen until the maybe the third quarter of 2022 but it does mean that the market will know that this is coming and it will start to move the rates up and they can still say that they are accommodative if they make three rate hikes and rate hikes are usually a quarter of a point so that quarter of a point can go three times before it hits 0.75 which would be great which would be much much more beneficial to the RTA but they can with that 0.75 historically that is still easy monetary policy so you see that inflation here on this slide is just has to be brought down and since they have been buying mortgages which then increases the home cost this will also keep coming down on the next slide you can see that manufacturing has can't has been coming back but now is struggling and the reason for that is because they are having difficulty getting their supplies in just just as in the housing market all construction is slowing down because of the supply chain problem in housing we actually have seen that the housing starts have fallen on the supply chains they can't get the lumber the aluminum the copper but the permits are up and that means that there's a still a great a great need for and demand for new housing coming in and with manufacturing struggling because of the ports and the trains this is all affecting the consumer and what they can buy there's one other thing here that's playing into very much into the equation right now coming into December and that's the uncertainty in the markets now we know Powell is going to be the Fed chair so that's good takes away one bit of uncertainty there but within the next 5 to 15 days because Secretary Yellen has changed her estimate we face the ongoing political theater of the debt ceiling and that is going to be something that is it's very complex but it is truly a it's a done deal when build back America and the other plans the other stimulus plans those are plans that are already passed that is debt but now we have to going into an election year look at the the problems of setting and including and in and increasing the debt service the debt ceiling and that's going to be something that's going to hurt us during the next month hopefully that will be mirroring or paralleling the the good news on the tapering another part of that inflation by the way is the oil which has come down from over $80 a barrel down to 65 or 67 so that's good but I wanted to show you this one slide because I think it shows exactly what we were talking about on the policy on the portfolio you can see on the this is the the local government pools 
on the green line, and you can see that ever since COVID has hit, we <coughs> have been staying very, very, very low. That won't change until the end, uh, or hopefully the second or third quarter of 22. But where you can pick up some additional yield is in that two-year area, which is the blue one, because that shows that the yield is higher if you were to go out to the five-year, which we are not recommending at this time then you can see how the curve is responding and how much additional yield you can um, gain on the portfolio. So we're gonna be working, continuing to work with staff um, who are very easy to work with and very open to these ideas and knowing that we can get some more additional um, yield and earnings for the, for the authority. So um, with that, if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Any questions, comments? Just a quick question, Chairman. <clears throat> so we're already laddering, I call it, the, our deposits now, right, since September? Um, we have. Well. Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, the, 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 the entire portfolio is liquid right now. So you have money sitting in the pools, and you have, sit, and you have money sitting in the bank. But until we get a safekeeping account open, at the bank, uh, there's no way to buy a security because you have nowhere to safe keep it. But that is almost complete at this time. Do we know when it'll be implemented? It, it should be within I the next. Think, go ahead. <laughs> I would say the next two weeks. Yeah. I didn't hear the answer. I, I would say the next. I would say in the. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Patterson. Robert, you <laughs> All right, I'll say then. I would say in the next couple of months or so, like I said, once a safekeeping account is established, then we'll start to ladder them out. Thank you. Up to about two years. Thank you. Yeah, I like that return a lot better. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Great. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, Ms. Patterson. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Item B is October 2021 financial report. Okay, this uh, lines up with the board priority of public image and transparency. So some highlights for the month, operating revenues is about 83.5% of our baseline. Our operating expenses is about 103%, and that is more due to um, medical claims that we had during the given of the month. And combined revenues is about almost 84% of baseline. So if you see column two is our actual revenues um, for October. You have 3.1 million on a budget of 3.7. The next slide I'll show you where the shortfall is coming from. Our expenses is 3.8 on a budget of 3.6, again, basically on due to medical claims for a, a deficit of about almost $700,000. So on the far right column is a percentage on the revenues you would obviously like to see them all 100% or better, and that's compared to budget. Um, as you see, uh, we have um, passenger services about 95%, so the fares that we collect from the passengers riding around, we have put a low expectation on our budget for this year. Our bus advertising is a little above it at almost 13,000, a budget of 11.2. Our other operating revenues of about 32,000 was driven down a little bit because we are selling 13 uh, buses or disposing of 13 buses and we paid for the expense of disposing. We haven't received the revenues yet from that. So that's offset this month. Um, sales tax is just what we budgeted for what we did last year. Um, if you take a look at September sales tax, um, September we uh, beat our projection of the previous year of about 300,000, so we're hoping to close that gap because we're hoping October will be a little higher. But that's just 2.7 to almost 2.8 is what we budgeted because of last year's numbers. The deficit really comes from the grant side of it here. We budgeted 642,000. We have 7.7 .7 million over the course of the year, and we just evenly distribute that over the 12 months. We typically pull most of our grant revenue in the early months of the year, so we see the deficit at the end of the years. Investment income is just as Linda has went over. Uh, most of our portfolio is liquid, therefore, with the low rates, we're just shy on their income. And then our lease revenue is $41,000 on a budget of $40,000. So our leases are, are bringing in the revenues that we need. 
just kind of where the money went, purchase transportation, about 600,000 or 20%. Miscellaneous, about uh, 2% at 44,000. Other uh, supplies to keep the buses running for the month, about $225,000, $226,000, and about $11,000 for COVID supplies. Uh, salaries a little shy of 1.1 million or 36%. Benefits 590,000, almost 591,000 at uh, 20%. Uh, services, $320,000 at 11%, and the utilities, 55000 at 2%, and insurance, almost thirty seven, almost $38,000 at 1%. So our expenses, kind of contrary to the revenue here, on the far right-hand corner, you want to see everything below 100% if all possible, and all the categories are, which means we are saving based on our budget. The one uh, line item that's above it is 122% is the benefits, and that, again, is due to medical claims for the month. Now, we're hoping that everybody's trying to get their medical expenses out of the way and not have medical expenses during the holiday season, having surgeries or anything like that, and finish the year a little stronger medically. So we had a budget of $3 million, came in at uh, $2,958,000. Year to date, total revenues over expenses we were on the positive cash flow of about $6.9 million. Operating revenues is almost 101% of budget. Department expenses about 7.5% under budget. Total revenues, $48 million on a budget of 47. Uh, a lot of it is due to the $8 million on the capital funding for the, the CRISA grant, about uh, $6.8, $6.9 million. Our expenses come in at 41 million, almost 41.1 on a budget of 43.9. So you see a positive cash flow of about $6.9 million. Again, on the revenue side, uh, the only shortfall you see is uh, the operating revenues. Uh, passenger services is down a little bit from what we projected it would be, and net um, investment income is about 70% of what we budgeted. $39 million, almost $40 million in operating revenues. Capital grant donations are reimbursements for our capital projects that we've done, about $8 million for a total revenue of $48 million. Uh, where's the money go year to date? Purchase transportation, $5.7 million or 21%. Miscellaneous, $425,000 at 2%. Or other, about close to $2 million to keep our buses running. Uh, $118,000 on COVID supplies, $10.3 million on salaries, benefits $5 million at 18%, services $3.2 million at 12%, utilities $637,000 at 2%, insurance $361,000 or $362,000 at 1% as well. Our expenses, the only two line items above the 100% on expenses is the benefits, again, uh, a lot of it due to medical claims and uh, utilities, um, a little higher gas prices we've been paying over the last few months in here. $27.7 million of total expenses for the year on a budget of $30 million, so about a $2.3 million savings on expenses. Our fair recovery ratio so far for 2021 is 3.07%. Typically, it rains around 6.5, but low ridership um, is driving it down to about 3.1. Why do we think this is lower than COVID? Uh, there's a lot of factors that come into it. Uh, the ridership levels, even though they're starting to bounce back a little bit right now, I mean, and it's marginally bouncing back. Obviously, it's not anywhere close to it. Um, it it's, it's really not just the ridership when it is that day. It's what time they're riding and what discounts you're getting, so how many off peaks that you're getting as well. So our typical fare is 75 cents. People on average pay about 23, 24, for 25, 25 cents. If you're riding off peak, it could be as low as 10 cents. So it's really when you're riding. And so the, I guess the question is the denominator or numerator, whichever one it is, the cost, is that including COVID supplies when you're factoring in the cost per ride? It's a total cost, yes, sir. It's a part of our operational expense. So part of this would be the amount of money that's being spent in addition to the amount of money that's coming in. Correct. Okay. So just kind of a 13 month um, trend of our sales tax. 
So if you take a look month over month, our actual in September of 2020, we budgeted or we came in at $3 million. Last month we came in at 3.3 million, so about $318,000 more than what came in last year. And that's what I was saying a little earlier, we're hoping the gap comes in a little higher this month, so we close that deficit of $600,000 that we're short this month. We won't get our actual for this month until about sometime next week. It's a two month delay. Any questions? Real quick, I, it's a little off this topic, but where are we on the Fair Recovery Committee meeting? So we're trying to get, we had a date um, of October 19th. Right. Uh, there were some co scheduling conflicts between the county and such, so we weren't able to get everybody together. Right now we're just trying to get everybody scheduled. I, I, we don't anticipate it being Octo and here in December with holidays in there, so we're hoping sometime in January, but January. Okay. we're just trying to get everybody's schedules together right now. Thank sir. you, Robert. Yes, sir. Any further questions? Um, item C is procurement update. So uh, this lines up with the board image of transparency, uh, public image. So our current procurements right now, we have our MIS software uh, RFP out right now. It's a five year with two one year options. We're expecting about $1.8 million over the five year period. This should come to the committee in January and possibly a board in February. Bus shelter amenities, a three year agreement with two a one two year option and about $9 million over the five year period. We're looking to spend on shelters and amenities. We're looking at the purchase restoration and repurposing of the Clayburg Bank. This is a two year process that we've come to with the FTA. Um, we are putting out an RFP six months at a time. So the first RFP went out, it's on the street right now. Um, if we get a good proposal out there, that could end it and we can repurpose the bank. If it's, so we don't see some type of action, we can issue out the RFP out at least three more times to meet the two year period in there, so um, it could be anywhere from six months to two years, depending on when the RFPs come in. But we got it for two more years. Yes, sir. <laughs> Our power washing and transfers, uh, it's a one-year contract or one-year option in here. Uh, it was gonna come back to the board, but we're extending the contract right now. We're still doing some paperwork on that, so we'll issue out uh, the option year at that point in time. Our van pool services, a three-year contract with two one-year options and about $99,000 for the three-year period. And we're looking for the first option year to exercise that. And that's our van pool program that we talked about a little bit in the orientation where we match up to 50% depending on year for your services starting and ending. Uh, Three-month outlook for the signature authority of the CEO, so these projects are less than $50,000. Our Remix Transit, it's a planning software. We're looking for a one-year contract for $31,000. Uh, this is actually the typo that removed that line item. It will be on the second page. The FleetNet software license and support is a one-year contract, about $28,750. Our DRI, um, a, uh, AVL software maintenance, is a one-year contract, a little under $48,000. So this is the Intergovernmental Risk Pool. This is the Southwest uh, Military Task Force, about $25,000 a year. We have a social media a monitoring uh, application here, a one-year agreement, a little less than $8,000. And then our website hosting, about a little under $15,000. Of course, we have the marina out there, about $6,100 a year. I always leave on a high note on that one there for us. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Any questions? Anybody want to lease a marina? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll charge you $6,101. We can make a little profit on that. <laughs> um, uh, item D, October 2021 20, Safety and Security Report. Thank you, Robert. Good morning again. For the uh, safety and security report, uh, we do have in uh, October, we did have four accidents, three were non-preventable, meaning it wasn't our fault, and one was deemed preventable. Uh, October collision rate is 1.98. In the month of October, we, uh, we drove 200, uh, thousand miles, uh, bringing the year-to-date collision rate is 1.22. And for our 
uh, monthly contacts, we had 426. Uh, top five took about 97%. Always our quality of life is the highest with 195. Uh, we do our very best to have a good relationship with, with our customers, give them directions, and um, also if they need medical attention, uh, we provide that uh, with a call to uh, the Corpus Christi Fire Department. And uh, security updates for the Staple Street Center. Uh, in the months past, we were uh, having uh, around 80 or 90 uh, entries to our building. Uh, in the last month or so, uh, we've gone from that amount to close to uh, 180, 190. And this is because of uh, the uh, holidays and the better situation that we have uh, reference the uh, vaccination and uh, that type of conversation. So we're getting uh, more traffic uh, through oh, our geez. security checkpoint and also that number moves up because of the Greyhound uh, people traveling more. With the uh, Robstown Police Department, uh, they provide uh, the canine service. We did board uh, two weeks ago on a Friday, uh, 11 buses, and we uh, uh, make sure that everybody's off the bus Canine uh, goes in, does the service, um, all went well. As usual, our customers feel safe and really appreciate us doing that type of service uh, through our system. And our rover continues to do well. Uh, I've mixed the uh, evening patrol between the four and 10, and also um, during the morning hours, uh, early at seven, you know, our rover goes in the downtown area and this uh, immediate area to make sure that everything's uh, well for our customers and then goes out through the south side. Um, things are working well because we have uh, done two patrols in the morning and, and afternoon. Uh, also with the approval of the board of directors when we added more security, um, it's working very, very well. We have less incidents at transfer stations because we have security uh, during the daytime and then sometimes in the evening or morning, we have the uh, police uh, working for us. Any questions? Mike, Any questions for Mike? Yeah, quick question, Mike. Is there a cost for the Robstone K-9 unit? No, there's, there's zero um, cost to us. We worked a, a um, a, uh, an agreement that they provide that service free to us and they use that as a training for the canine unit. Uh, these are well-trained uh, canines that uh, small communities uh, around our service area call them, uh, reference any traffic stops, even DPS, Border Patrol, uh, and the small communities, uh, police departments, uh, Drisco, Bishop, uh, Abadulce, Banquete, uh, so they provide that service free to them also. Is that the reason that we use them over CCPD, since there's well, a little more of an overlap? That's not the reason, but uh, because CCPD is usually very, very busy, and they have provided that service to us in the past, but uh, we contacted uh, uh, Robson Police Department, they agreed to it, and also we're gonna start in January with the Precinct 5 K-9 unit also, in Robstown. So we'll have uh, two different uh, canine units working for us free. So it's an availability issue, basically? Yes. Okay. For CCPD, yes. Thanks. So Mike, we're the uh, continuing education for the canines. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, yes, it, it is because <laughs> <laughs> they, do, they, they do have to go back to San Antonio and get trained uh, on a yearly basis. And then like Robstown uh, canine handler, uh, moved on to the sheriff department. The uh, the new one has to re re uh, associate himself with a canine unit that he had to go back to San Antonio and get the training. So it's an ongoing uh, thing. So thank you. You're Mike. accepting any more dogs? I got a Schnauzer that needs some <laughs> training. <laughs> well, those uh, just to let you know that this cost for this the canine units go between fifty and seventy five thousand. So th those are expensive uh, uh, canines. So they're, they're part of the law enforcement unit. Eddie, you gonna pay that bill for the training? <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs>
real quick for this is probably a Derek question on those four uh, buses that were in the accidents did it take any of those out of commission fully no no they're they're small uh, accidents either they get bumped from behind or like I said three of them were not our fault uh, even though it drives the uh, the year-to-date collision rate up even though it's not fault but uh, they're small accidents that don't require that much uh, maintenance on the vehicle itself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Item uh, E is October 2021 operations report. Morning again, everyone. Uh, board priority for this is public image and transparency. So here for some highlights that the passenger trips were up 2.1% to 223,403. The revenue service hours were up 0.3% 20 to 24,200, and the revenue service miles were up 11.6% to 399,635, and that is uh, primarily an increase from the van pool program. Here you can see the ridership trends. For the system-wide monthly ridership by mode, overall, or again, our system was up 2.1%, but it's still down 53.8% from pre-COVID. Our fixed route system was down 0.3%, and while I got a little excited, because we did have some increases in ridership during the weekdays, the, the weekends have been a little flat, and we had a, a different, um, some, some variables that happened year to year, like different number of weekdays. We had less weekdays and some heavy rain days at the beginning of the month. Beeline is up 22.9%, but still down 34.2% from pre-COVID. Our FlexiB service in Port Aransas is up 70.2%, and up 17.2% from pre-COVID. The van pool program is up 91.9%, but down 4.1% from pre-COVID. And the rural services, like Real and Pasano, are up 34.5% from last year, but down 69% from pre-COVID. Now, our system-wide year-to-date ridership, overall our system is down 24.4%, and as a reminder that we did have about two and a half months of solid ridership before we went into the shutdown. And so the system is down about 55.8% from pre-COVID. Our fixed route system is down 26.5% from last year and 57.4% from pre-COVID. And B-line services are now up 0.3% from last year, but still remain down 37.7% from pre-COVID. The FlexiB services are up 30.6%, but down 32.8% from pre-COVID. And our van pool program is up 37.3% um, from last year and up 8.8% from the pre-COVID numbers. And our rural services are now down only 8.3% from last year, but still remain down 53.7% from their pre-COVID. Here, this is our quarterly cost per passenger. So this is July through September. And as we've seen that the incremental ridership increases in our fixed route system, you can see the cost per passenger has decrease slightly on the fixed route system. And we've seen similar changes on MV's fixed route. The FlexiB remains one of our, our higher cost services per passenger. You can see the paratransit, the B-line has uh, remained fairly constant, the slight increase. And that is a large part due to the performance metrics we've talked about, which are affected by the cancellation rates. And then you can see our van pool program remains the, the lowest cost per passenger. For our fixed route system, there are no issues here. Everything, no issues with timeliness. I will highlight we had a significant increase of wheelchair boardings in October. These are our current uh, routes and bus stops that are affected by the bond projects. As you'll see, we have 75 stops that are impacted or closed at this time. This is a list of upcoming projects that will affect our, our bus stops, which will include 50 additional stops, 54. Here for our B-line performance metrics, you see we did not meet the passenger per hour metric at 2.19. We are still experiencing some same-day cancellation rates of close to 20 to 25 percent, especially around the, the, the weekends. I will uh, say that January 1st, we have a, our no-show policy restarts. So uh, we had been relaxed on that through COVID, so we will be re-implementing that, the no-show and cancellation policy. And our miles between road calls were just under the standard as well at 9,887. 
And they did see a slight increase in wheelchair boardings on the Beeline service as well. Our customer assistant forms, we had eight for the, the month. Our miles between road call and our large fleet or the Gilly fleet, which were above our standards, so no issues there. And as requested at the last board meeting, a few of the initiatives that we've worked on to, to help improve the ridership. The, the one, one is the new cutaways being put in there, which improved the customer experience. Uh, so they're more reliable and have USB chargers, a little more comfortable seating. We've been working closely with the colleges and universities to help coordinate the current and future service needs. Some of those we won't fill immediately, but we've had talks with the university about what their goals are for the next five years, um, ridership-wise, and the needs that they have, and, and the ways that they want to get the students more involved with the downtown area as well. Um, we expanded the, actually, we're developing the service plans to serve the new Del Mar South Campus, which for this uh, will go live in, in the fall, and then at Carroll High School, which will be opening as well. We, earlier in the year, we expanded the service on the Route 28 on uh, Leopard and Navigation to help service the, the um, Coastal Bend Food Bank. Also, we continue to pilot Route 95, Port Aransas Express, which helps get the employees into Port Aransas from, from Corpus Christi, Ingleside, and uh, Aransas Pass. And also, with, with marketing's help, we continue to promote our safety measures and that the safety of public transportation as a whole, and including things like what uh, safety and security's been doing with the dogs and the extra security out at the stations. With that, take any questions that you have. Any questions for Derek? Yeah, one quick one. Derek, have you been able to put your finger, you know, is it one issue from ridership of pre-COVID to now? Is it, are they scared to get on the bus, you think, or? Well, one thing that we, we've seen kind of from the onset is that beforehand you had families that, that rode the bus together. So now instead of seeing the, the, the mom and five kids and maybe your sister, you're seeing like one or two people that are, are going to the store and do the shopping. And additionally, even with the, the colleges and universities, well, Texas A&M may be saying that they want to be all in person that they're not still. I mean, we, we know in the spring they're still scheduling a, a large amount of online classes there. So that helps impact the ridership. And we, we all know the challenges in the workforce that we've, that we've had as well for the last several months. So if people aren't working, they're not likely to be riding the system as much. Now, as the schools have started to be a little bit more in person, we've seen that boost happen during the weekdays of our ridership. Uh, the weekends have still stayed somewhat stagnant. Um, as you've all seen, the B-Line continues to, to increase, so we're seeing more of the disadvantaged community getting out for appointments and going to the stores, which is which positive, but um, also that's more of a scheduled ride service that they, they have. Thank you. Is there a fee for CCISD students? They, they pay the student rate of the 25 cents. 25 cents? Okay. All right. Um, let me look at something. <laughs> a promotion. Um, thank you. Appreciate it, Derek. Uh, item F is update on capital projects. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Here we go. All right. And these are basically alphabetical. So we'll start with our ADA bus stop program background. We currently have 1,375 bus stops. We've completed six ADA phases. Uh, we've improved 852 bus stops, so basically around 62%. Uh, we awarded phase seven this year, estimating 126 bus stops. That'll put us at about 71% ADA compliancy. And we started this program probably back in 2010. Um, the proposed phase eight, we're estimating 54 bus stops. Once we conclude that phase, we'll be at 75%. So we have a remaining bus stops after phase A, 343, which is really remarkable. Um, Jorge's vision for this program is trying to garner additional grant funding so we can accelerate the sidewalk improvements and partner with the city of Corpus Christi to work with them on their ADA transition plan. Here's some pictures before and after or ADA improvements, so the grassy area here versus the new pad that's there with a shelter. Fairlane parking lot improvement. 
The contract amount, $729,929. The contract was awarded to MAKO Contracting. It was funded with the 2019 competitive grant, basically removed and replaced 4,900 square feet and replaced it with eight inch thick concrete. We removed and replaced an ADA ramp and employee at our employee entrance. And we installed a sidewalk and crosswalk for employees to the bus yard. And we completed the project in October, 2021. Here's pictures of the sidewalk area that we worked on um, to get our operators safely to the bus yard. And here's that employee entrance that leads into the, from the main parking lot into the building. And then here's an additional picture of phase 3A and 3B with concrete pour. And here's the dispatch area. Another project um, which was estimate which was 24,500 so under the CEO's authority there was a vacant building on the property um, and so we awarded that and here's some of the pictures of the work and here's the final outcome so it's very clean at this point Del Mar College Southside campus the estimated project cost for two bus stops 2,884,509 or 1,442,254 per bus stop. It was a competitive grant award funded at 80% federal, so 1,153,803 is federal. Ramirez and Turner Architects were approved by the board in, September, in the summer. Super stop location one is at Yorktown and one is on Rodfield Road. We will build these two shelters at each location and all four bays initially. Estimated completion for this project is fall or early summer. Now, of late, the Del Mar has announced that they plan to have a, a soft opening this summer. So we're going to try yes, and sir. accelerate the, the completion of those a little earlier than the fall. Yes, sir. But uh, we'll have Absolutely. to see how that works out. And here is a rendering of what it will look like with the canopies and the complete uh, concrete build out, because in the end, we will look to have four different bays uh, for our riders there and for the south side. But we're going to have two bays, right? Initially, we start with two bays. Yeah. yeah, we'll start with two canopies, yes, but we'll have the whole drive. That's what I meant. Yeah, yes. two canopies. Yes, sir. Um, and so this was a grant application that we were awarded, 2,844,884,509. And then here are the two locations, one on Rodfield and one on Yorktown. You're not going to put any facilities for the bus drivers to, you know, step into or anything? Not at this one, sir. This is just the super stop. Okay. Kind of like the stops for Texas A&M. Mary Carroll High School, the Board of Directors approved the Memorandum of Agreement in April. Estimated completion is fall of next year. Estimated cost, $150,000. Basically, it's a new 17-foot toller shelter, bus turn-in, shelter pad, sidewalk, solar lighting, digital monitor, uh, and it will be at Costores Road near uh, Saratoga Intersection. Port Air's transfer station, estimated cost by million eight eleven six forty five. We purchased the Clayburg Bank property late 2017. We received a competitive grant for this, 80%. It's funded by low, uh, federal dollars, 4,649,316. Uh, we submitted the final and revised environmental report to FTA um, as requested in 2021. Here is a rendering or an overview of the area. Uh, we had a, a Port Air, the Port Air's milling project took place <laughs> in June. We had our groundbreaking in June. The architectural pool has been selected for uh, the various projects uh, by the Board of Directors. Janak and Associates were selected for Port Airs and the projected completion date is in end of 2022. Here's another aerial where you can see the bus bays, 10 of them. Uh, we will keep the existing Port Air Station in operation. 
until the end of the project, and then at the end, that station will be demolished. Um, so that's kind of an overall layout. How long do we have to wait for the building, Jorge? Two years? Mm -hmm. For the building to come down? Yeah, I think if, there was a window. If it's not window. refurbished, it's two years. Okay. Yes, sir. Shelter refurbishment program, this is done very well. It was awarded in November of 2019. It's a five-year program. The contract went to ARD's construction and paving for the removal, repair, painting, and reinstallation of the bus stop shelters. Um, year one, we awarded 234,500, and we completed 76 bus stops. In year two, the award is 240,594, and year to date, we're not through yet for this year's contract, it's 61. And here are some pictures before and after. The Robstown uh, outlet station or shelter. Shelter amenities program. Again, we have 1,375 bus stops. We have 71 existing total shelters. We have 128 sunshades. We have 874 benches. We have 12 semi seats, which is the pole with the two seats, 647 trash receptacles, and 40 new toller shelters with the six foot advertising bench, solar lighting, and a trash receptacle. FTA is requiring, which is slowing the process a little bit, environmental documents as well as all the locations. Uh, the proposal, as I mentioned before, was a three-year basin and one two-year option. Now, once that's awarded, it expedites the process going forward so that all we have to do is issue the task order. Jorge and I have been having discussions regarding his vision for this program, and he wants to seek grant funding to accelerate the shelter program and to pretty much double what we have out there. So. <clears throat> Just in looking at that, we're basically looking at 650 bus stop shelters. We want to be able to have lighting at every bus stop, so beacon lights. Um, basically, that would be about 725 beacon lights because we'd have 650 shelters would, would have its own solar lighting. We would have either a bench at every location where we have um, right away, or we would have the semi seats if we don't have right away. So we are working towards, and with this additional funding that should be coming out shortly, uh, we will apply for grants and then we will look to accelerate this program to where every stop has an amenity, whether it's a shelter, whether it's an advertising bench, or whether it's a semi seat and they will all have lighting, so we'll no longer have dark bus stops. Right. And the semi-seat that, that I would like for us to consider is not the, not the semi-seat with the small seat. I like the semi-seat that was on the uh, floor of the expo, where the bench is actually a little bit bigger than just a little seat. Yeah, I'm excited about those. So I presume we're, we're going to engage the firm in D.C. to help us with these grants? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes. Sir. In fact, we're already working on it. Yeah, we are. Any uh, questions for Sharon? Good job. Thank Great you, Great report. Sir. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Very Thank excited you. Very to see what comes in the next two years. Sounds like a lot going on in 22. So. Sir, it's been an honor working with you. I just want to say that. And I know you have one more meeting, but I just want to say thank you for, for your guidance. Appreciate thank it. Sharon. I appreciate thank working you. with you. Um, item 14, CEO's report. All right, uh, board. Uh, over, the, over November, we were involved with several programs. One of them that uh, I found uh, very encouraging because I had new board members that were very engaged and asking some very good questions regarding the orientation that we provided uh, the new members and on November 19th. Uh, we also took a tour, and I think we'll set dates for the rest of the board members also to take a tour of uh, the Bear Lane facility and all the things that go on there. That's, that's the hub of how the, the, the business works at the RTA. We also, with our employees, uh, recognized our veterans during Veterans Day on November 11th. 
uh, as I mentioned earlier in the COVID report, we're working with the uh, uh, health department to ensure that uh, we provide the community and our employees COVID-19 vaccinations and flu shots. Uh, since we did not have our typical uh, Thanksgiving luncheon for our employees, uh, we gave the employees $25 HEB gift cards to help them with their Thanksgiving. And uh, we also are planning to give our employees, since we're not going to have the Christmas party this year, again, because of COVID concerns, uh, we will give the employees uh, $50 uh, HEB gift cards. Uh, when they when they receive it, 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 it thanks the employees from the board, from the executive team, and the the RTA in general. So the recognition that uh, the board is behind us in in these efforts. Also, from the community, we were involved with the. You police. didn't hear about the inflation, sir. Fifty dollars doesn't go a long way. <laughs> but that's uh, that that's. The cost would be for two adults at our Christmas party, so we try to keep it <laughs> within reason. But we were involved with PD at the Auto Theft Task Force. We have uh, four buses, one large one, three small ones, that have the, uh, the, uh, the warnings about leaving your cars unprotected during the holidays when shopping. And we did press conferences and uh, had a nice production on, on that. And, uh, and always trying to represent the RTA in a very positive and community-wide uh, basis. So that's my report. Great, thank you, sir. All right, last item of business is the board chair's report. As always, I'd love to share it with the rest of the board members. I'll start over here with Philip. Any comments, sir? See, it's so simple, I like it. A thumbs up, and Director Allison. I really enjoyed that KPMG report, Derek, and I'm looking, I didn't see it in the Dropbox. I hope we'll get a chance to look at that again. Um, sounds like a good relationship has been initiated there, so thanks for putting that together. Director Silvazar. I wanted to comment on, on the CEO's report, um, and it was, uh, Charo, it was, Ms. Charo, it was in the weekly report, but it was not in the agenda packet. And typically the comments that are made by the board in all the meetings that I've ever been in, when you have a committee report, those comments are made so that way the board can address them. Also in the comment that our attorney made, it is prohibited, whereas none of that language is stated in the report that was made other than that PF, is it PFIA has allowed it, but there's still a lot of questions around it. So my comment to you, Jorge, is that can we make sure that comments from the board are addressed in the agenda packet? Yes, sir. And also, are those weekly reports part of public record or not? Yes, sir. They are? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Director Dominguez. And Mary yeah, they're, they're, they're geared for informing the board of everything. Correct. If, correct. if, if, no, I get if that. there's it, ever it, an indication that there's going to be uh, publication of that outside the agency, right. then I would scale back the report. It's more specific. You, you, you address a lot of things in the weekly report, which is great. But when we have a meeting or a committee meeting, comments that are made by the board, especially one that I'm looking at finding a way to have credit unions be participants, and apparently there's, uh, it's, it's prohibited based on the attorney's uh, comment today. That's not in the weekly report. But I think it's important when somebody looks at our packet that those comments that are made by the board are addressed in the packet. The, the other part is fine, but it's more generalized. The comments that are made are more generalized in the statements that were made in your weekly report, which says that it can still be considered, but there's a lot of hurdles that we have to go through to get there. And if it's not legal for us to become a member of a credit union, then that kills it right there. So anyway, Merry Christmas to everybody. <laughs> Director Dominguez. Say, uh, thank you all for, you know, <clears throat> all of a sudden I was, you know, it's already gonna be 2022. The year went by quick. Um, uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everyone. I know everyone's working real hard. I appreciate it. 
I did go to the to the event that you had earlier um, in November for the lock it and hide it uh, event at the at Moore Plaza. That was a really well run event as usual. Thank you so much for all you do. Thank you everybody for your hard work. Uh, congratulations again to Robert, uh, Sandy, and Alejandro for your hard work on the budgeting award. Um, good things to come in 2022. Merry Christmas, everybody. Uh, congratulations on the award um, and all the hard work everybody's done. Sharon, you're doing a great job on <clears throat> getting the, all those projects moving forward and moving quickly. And uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. Director Wilbrun. Merry Christmas. Director Chattel. Thank you all for your hard work and informative um, presentations. And uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, um, and I hope everybody has a great New Year as well. Director Canales. Uh, I'd like to say a special thank you to our chairman and CEO for our orientation and that we had uh, recently. It was extremely informative, as well as to all the staff who attended. Uh, it certainly helped me understand a lot of things. So now you'll probably have a lot more questions from me, unfortunately, uh, to our attorney, Mr. Bell. Also, uh, again, that was very informative and very helpful. Uh, the presentations, as always, are amazing. Uh, so it was a great day today. Uh, also, want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, ha Happy Holidays. Oh. Um if I could take just a brief opportunity to talk to each of you, it's interesting. I'm glad that everyone's here today, but I um, wanted to talk a little bit about remote participation in meetings and that uh, during COVID, the governor did a, give an executive uh, emergency orders that relaxed uh, requirements, but now we're out of that emergency phase and we have to strictly comply with the Open Meetings Act. And you still can participate remotely but it is critical that both the audio and the video uh, be uh, on while you're participating remotely because the law actually says people present at the meeting room need to be able to see the face and demeanor of board members participating remotely. Uh, and I know all of your demeanors are wonderful, but we need to, we need to see your demeanor uh, while you're participating. Uh, there, it's not a requirement that those remotely see your demeanor here. And if you've participated remotely, it's kind of hard to see everybody's face here. But the requirement is for those board members participating remotely that we see your demeanor. Uh, and and when, you, when we meet all those tests and your candidate is present and uh, we can uh, proceed with the meeting. But, no, uh, no more PJs, Matt. <laughs> so we'll uh, look, Top up, sir. Top up. look for your smiling or your growling faces, whatever they might be, uh, when you're participating uh, remotely uh, at any board meetings. Uh, we're also required to have a quorum present in the meeting room in order to con continue with the meeting. Uh, but uh, anyway, it was good to see all of you at the, uh, or several of you at the board orientation. That was uh, interesting. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me about that. Um, last closing comments for myself is the orientation. I thought it was really great. I would encourage board members, if you kind of haven't been there in a, in a few years, make an effort just to go by and visit again. I think it's, you know, a lot of improvements have occurred over the last few years. I would encourage you just to go visit and, and take a quick tour and just get an update on that. Um, the expo was fantastic. It was, it's been a little bit since we last attended. A lot of new services and uh, obviously contractors and, and various amenities that were that were showcased. Um, and I think you know we went and saw this whole Uber uh, app opportunity. You know that we should probably look into in the future as far as the and the shelters and the Gen Fair uh, that the staffs already looking at now. So uh, a lot of great things were were expoed out there. Um, committee meeting I think we the committee meeting this month is on the 22nd we may look at modifying that I know some people may be on vacation during that time so um, I'll get with the chairs and kind of look at that and uh, we'll see if we need to move that up uh, uh, on the agenda so staff please let me know if that's something or is it canceled the our committee meeting I thought right now is scheduled for the 22nd uh, we've uh Canceled? It's, yeah, it's okay, it's canceled. It has it done. It's canceled, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Other than that. You didn't get the memo? <laughs> I didn't get the memo. It was in the weekly report. <laughs> um, 
I still see it on my calendar on here. I still see it, it wasn't on in the, It wasn't in the, uh, uh, in the... Other than that, it's, it's truly been a pleasure to work with staff. Thank you for the eight years that I've, I've been able to work with you and a strategic look at where we are, where we were and where we are today. It's been a lot of effort because of you guys. You've done a phenomenal job and I appreciate all the work day in and day out that you put for the agency and for this community. Um, and uh, we're kind of up here on a volunteer basis, but we're here, you know, visiting once a month, twice a month. So you guys really do all the work and I would just want to applaud you and thank you for all that you do. Uh, with that, I, it's bittersweet for me. It's, it's a full board. This is my last full board meeting. I've enjoyed serving along each and every one of you over the last year, two years, four years, uh, and all the other board members that I've had the luxury of serving with. Um, truly, truly, if you, you spend enough time here, you develop a true passion for transit. And uh, it's, it is a bittersweet time for me because I think we've come a long way and I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm ready to pass the torch. <laughs> uh, it, is, it, is, it is a good amount of work, and, uh, but I think there's a good group of folks here that can carry that on and, and move it forward. And I look forward to seeing what the agency is going to look like in the next uh, few years um, as we really grow and expand our, our, uh, our uh, amenities and service. Um, staff, happy holidays. Okay, board members, happy holidays. Be safe out there. And I'll see you guys in the new year. Time is now 1025. Call this meeting adjourned. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Y'all have a good Christmas.